All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here is the list of topics to be covered in this video. In problem one, we have a table that gives the annual sales in millions of a product. And first, we want to determine the average rate of change of annual sales from 2000 to 2001. So the average rate of change is just a slope. It's a delta y over delta x. The two points we need to use are for x equals 2000 to 2001, and the associated y values from the table are 231 and 251. So we compute delta y to be the difference of the y coordinates, which is 20, and delta x to be the difference of the x coordinates, which is simply 1, which gives the average rate of change to be 20, and this is measured in millions of dollars per year. For part B, what's the average rate of change from 2000 to 2006? Now one of our points is the same, but the other changes to 2006 comma 231. We compute delta y to be zero. We don't really need to compute delta x at this point, but it is six. The ratio zero over six is now zero million dollars per year. In problem two, based on the graph below, we need to estimate the average rate of change from x equals one to x equals three. So we appear to have the points 1, 1, and 3, 5. Now we can compute the slope of the line connecting them, our delta y over delta x. Delta y, the difference in the y coordinates is 4, and delta x is 2, which gives a slope, an average rate of change, of 4 over 2, which is just 2. Next up, find the average rate of change of g of x equals negative x cubed minus 3 from x equals minus 1 to x equals 2. Now we don't have a graph for this function, but the process doesn't change. We plug in x equals minus 1 and we compute g of minus 1 is negative 2. We plug in x equals 2 and we compute g of 2 is negative 11. So the points in question are negative 1 comma negative 2 and 2 comma 11. So now we can compute our average rate of change, our slope of the line connecting these two points, to be negative 3. In problem four, we'll find the average rate of change of the function f of x equals 5x squared minus 4 on the interval from 3 to b. Now the x value of b isn't specified, but that doesn't really change anything. f of b is simply 5b squared minus 4. f of 3 works out to be 41. So the points in question are b comma 5b squared minus 4 and 341. So we can compute delta y over delta x. We take the difference in the y coordinates over the difference in the x coordinates to be 5b squared minus 45 over b minus 3. Now, in theory, we might be done, but there is some simplification that can be done, and it will be productive to do so. So we can factor a 5 out of this numerator, leaving behind b squared minus 9, which we recognize as the difference of two squares. The productivity in doing this factoring is that we can cancel the shared factor of b minus 3, giving us just 5 times b minus 3. Observe, however, that when b is equal to 3, that cancellation is not valid. So I would say that the average rate of change is 5 times b plus 3, provided that b isn't 3. Of course, if b were 3, the interval we started with would only have one point in it, and that's kind of why that value of b is excluded. In problem five, find the average rate of change of f of x equals one over x plus nine on the interval from eight to eight plus h. Well, f of eight plus h is one over eight plus h plus nine, or one over 17 plus h, whereas f of eight is simply one over 17. So delta y over delta x is the difference in these two y values over the difference in the two x values. Now we can simplify this a whole lot. So up in the numerator, we have a common denominator of 17 times 17 plus h. So the first term has to be multiplied by 17 over 17, and the second term by 17 plus h over 17 plus h. Also, the denominator simplifies to just being h. Now, the difference of those two things in the numerator, the 17 minus 17 cancel out, and the negative applies to the second term, giving us a negative h over, now the total denominator is 17 times h times 17 plus h. The h's cancel as long as h is not equal to zero, and this simplifies to be negative one over 17 times 17 plus h. And again, the forbidden value of h equals zero really specifically makes our interval from h to eight plus h only have one point in it, and we cannot compute a slope of a line given only one point. In problem six, Kimura rides her bicycle for two hours and is 18 miles from her house, and then riding for four hours, she is 34 miles away. What's the average rate during her trip? So the two points given are two hours comma 18 miles and four hours comma 34 miles. It's really not clear from the wording of this problem if we're trying to compute the average rate just over the two hours from t equals two to t equals four, or 
an average rate of change over the entire trip, in which case maybe we're starting at t equals zero and that first point is not relevant. But let's just use the two points that are given and presume that this is what the wording of this problem is asking for. So delta y over delta x is pretty easy to compute. It's just eight. By the way, this was verified as the correct answer according to our homework portal system, but I think the wording is not especially good. In problem seven, we have the function f of x equals 4x minus 5. Evaluate and simplify the following expressions, f of a, f of a plus h, f of a plus h minus f of a over h. Well, f of a is just 4a minus 5. f of a plus h is just 4 times a plus h minus 5, which we can distribute to be 4a plus 4h minus 5. So f of a plus h minus f of a all over h, we take the expression for f of a plus h, we subtract the expression for f of a, and using parentheses around it will be helpful to not make distribution errors, and we divide by h. Now up in the numerator, notice we have a 4a minus a 4a, and we have a negative 5 minus a negative 5. Those cancel, leaving behind just the 4h, and now we can cancel out the shared factor of h from numerator and denominator. So note, we were finding the slope delta y over delta x. That's what these average rates of change are. We have two y coordinates minus each other over the distance and the two x coordinates. But the function we started with was a line of slope four. So really all we did was we put two points on a line of slope four and asked what's the slope of the line connecting them? Well, it was gonna be four. Problem eight, for the function f of x equals three x squared minus two x, we need to evaluate each of these two expressions. Now for the first, f of x plus h, we simply plug in x plus h instead of x. We can square the x plus h squared, and then we can distribute the three and the two, but there are no shared terms here to collect. This is pretty much all we can do. For part b, we're gonna take f of x plus h, which we have just worked out, subtract f of x, and divide by h. Now we can distribute that minus sign, or we could just notice that between the two terms, we have a three x squared and a minus three x squared. We also have a negative two x and a minus negative two x. Those terms will cancel, leaving behind the terms six x h plus three h squared minus two h all over h. There is an h we can factor out of the numerator so that we can cancel it with that shared factor in the denominator, leaving behind six x plus three h minus two. Of course, this was only valid when h wasn't zero, otherwise the cancellation step wasn't available. For problem nine, given the function f of x equals one plus four x squared, we're gonna evaluate f of a, f of a plus h, then f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. Well, f of a is just one plus four a squared. f of a plus h is one plus four times the quantity a plus h squared, which we can distribute the four, square everything out, here we have it. And for part C, we're just gonna take the expression we've just worked out for f of a plus h. We're gonna subtract f of a and divide out h. So note, between the two expressions, there will be a one minus a one. There is also a four a squared minus a four a squared. So those terms cancel, leaving behind simply eight a h plus four h squared over h. We can factor an h out of the numerator so that we can cancel it out of the denominator, provided we're not attempting to cancel zero over zero for a final result of eight a plus four h. For problem 10, determine whether the graph below represents an increasing function or a decreasing function. Well, there's really nothing to work off of other than the picture, so let's just look at it, and as x moves to the right, the graph is moving down. The function is decreasing, that's really all there is to say here. For problem 11, identify the open intervals on which the function graph below is increasing and the open intervals on which it is decreasing. So we're gonna mark off on the graph where it appears to change from going up to going down or vice versa. So x equals one and x equals six appear to be two such divisions. To the left of one, in other words, from minus infinity to one, we appear to be going up. Whereas in between one and six, we are going down, we are decreasing. And then from six to the right, from six to infinity, we are increasing again. In problem 12, we have the function f of x equals 2x cubed minus 36x squared plus 120x plus 9. It has one local maximum and one local minimum. From the graph which is given, identify these local extrema and what values they take. Now all we can really do is look at the graph. Uh, once we start studying calculus, there are techniques to find them otherwise, but just by looking at the graph, there appears to be a local maximum at this point here where x is two, and there appears to be a local minimum down at this point where x is equal to 10. We can't really read off the value of the y coordinate from these points, but we can simply compute f of two, which works out to be 121, 
and we can also compute f of 10, which works out to be negative 391. So the local maximum is at 2, 121, and the local minimum is at 10, comma, negative 391. For problem 13, we have the graph of f of x given. Identify any local extrema and state open intervals on which the function is increasing or decreasing. And again, all we have is a graph to go off of. So there appears to be a single local maximum here at this point where x is 2. The corresponding y value looks like y equals 4. So there's a local maximum at 2 comma 4. The graph is increasing up to this point on the left hand side. So we are increasing on the interval from minus infinity to 2, whereas to the right, the graph appears to be going down. So we are decreasing on the interval from 2 to infinity. In problem 14, we are given the graph of f of x below. Identify inflection points and also open intervals on which the function is concave up or concave down. So the only tool for finding inflection points that we have at our disposal for now is simply to look for them by appearances to where the graph appears to be curving down more or versus curving up more. So the more technical way to state this, although still not 100% completely accurate, is that the tangent slope is increasing where the function is concave up or the tangent slope is decreasing where it is concave down. The true geometric definition of concavity actually has to do with secant lines connecting any two points in certain regions. If you are looking in a region and every secant line you can draw is always below the graph, that is concave down. Whereas if you are in a region and every possible secant line is above the graph, then the graph is called concave up on that region. Inflection points, again, for now, for the way we can talk about them, are where concavity changes. So let's take a look at these tangent slopes. From minus infinity up to minus 3, the tangent slope appears to be decreasing. We have tangent lines that have a very large positive slope. This tangent line is going up very quickly. However, if we continue to move to the right while still having tangent lines that are going up, they are doing so less steeply. The tangent slope has gone from a large positive number to a somewhat smaller positive number. But if we keep moving, that tangent slope actually becomes negative and actually gets bigger negative. So overall, our tangent slopes went from large positive to small positive to small negative to somewhat large negative. The tangent slope was decreasing. But starting at x equals minus 3 and moving to the right, the tangent slope appears to increase. It goes from a large negative tangent slope to a smaller negative tangent slope to a small positive tangent slope to a very large positive tangent slope. So what we suspect is that the graph is concave down from minus infinity to minus 3, the tangent slope was decreasing, concave up from minus 3 to infinity, the tangent slope was increasing, and at that point where it changed, negative 3 comma 0, we have an inflection point. We can also take a look at secant lines to arrive at the same conclusion. Pick any two x values from minus infinity to minus 3, put the corresponding points on the graph, and draw a secant line. For example, here, we have two x values both to the left of minus 3. We put points on the graph, and we draw a line connecting them. This line is completely underneath the graph. And if I change the two points I pick and draw secant lines, as long as I'm picking two points to the left of minus 3, I continue to get secant lines that are completely underneath the graph. But now, what if we pick x values to the right of minus 3 and create the similar secant lines? Now we have a line that is completely above the graph, and it doesn't matter how I pick my two points to the right of minus 3, I continue to get secant lines that are completely above the graph. But, what if I pick a single x value to the left of minus 3 and a single x value to the right? It becomes possible now to get a secant line that is not completely under and not completely over the graph. It crosses the graph. So, from minus infinity to minus 3, all secant lines are under the graph, whereas from minus 3 to infinity, all secant lines are above the graph. So we are concave down up to minus 3, then we are concave up past minus 3, and where did that concavity change? At an inflection point, negative 3, 0. In problem 15, we have four tables, each representing functions, and for each one, we need to determine if the function is increasing, decreasing, or neither, and if it is concave up, concave down, or neither. So first, are the values of the function themselves always getting larger? If so, that's an increasing function. If they are always getting smaller, that's a decreasing function. 
So looking at f of x, we start with a value of 144, and step by step, it is always getting smaller. So it's a decreasing function. For g of x, we start at a value of 4, and it is always getting bigger. So that is an increasing function. For h of x, we start at 196 and are always getting smaller. This is a decreasing function. And for k of x, we start at 56, and our values are always getting bigger. So this is an increasing function. Now for concavity, instead of looking at the values of the function, we look at slopes of tangent lines. Now our functions only exist for integer values of x, so instead of tangent lines, we're really going to compute delta y over delta x, setting delta x equal to 1, because that's the best we can do. If that tangent slope is always increasing, we are concave up. If it is decreasing, then we are concave down. So let's look at f of x. Step by step, we're going to compute how much the function is changing. So as x goes from 1 to 2, f of x goes from 144 to 100, so delta y over delta x is minus 44. The next step we go down by 36, the next down by 28, the next down by 20, and then the next down by 12. The fact that all of these values are negative tells me that the value was going down, tells me that the function was decreasing. However, let's look at what these values actually are. They start at negative 44 and go up it was always going up. That's concave up. Here are the tables for delta y over delta x for g of x. It starts at a value of 12 and always increases, so this function is concave up. Here is delta y over delta x for h of x. It starts at negative 12 and is always going down, so that is a concave down function. And here's delta y by delta x for k of x, and it starts at 44 and always goes down. So this function is also concave down. The real point here is that functions could be increasing or decreasing, or possibly neither, and functions can be concave up or concave down, or possibly neither. But there's no immediate relationship between those two things. You can be decreasing and concave up, as in the first function f of x, or you can be increasing and concave up, as it with g of x. You can be decreasing and concave down, or you can be increasing and concave down. So there's no immediate relationship between increasing and decreasing versus concave up, concave down. It's a common mistake for students to think that one immediately implies the other. They don't. For problem 16, here is the graph of a function. We need to evaluate a few things. First, what's the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x? So x is going to approach 1 from the left, and as it does so, it does not reach x equals 1. We're going to track the value of f of x. So here we have a value of x, a vertical line, and we have a point on the graph. So as the line slides right but never quite reaches 1, pay attention to the height of the point, the value of f of x. It is approaching 7. So the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x is 7. What about the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f of x? We do basically the same thing, but x approaches 1 from the right, does not reach 1, and we track the value of f of x. So again, we have our vertical line for a value of x, and we have a point where it intersects the graph. The line is going to slide to the left and approach 1, but not quite reach it. Pay attention to the height of the point of intersection. It seems to be approaching minus 3. So this limit is minus 3. Next, what's the limit as x approaches 1 where no direction is specified of f of x? Now, as x approaches 1 from both sides, it's not approaching a single value. From the left, it was approaching 7, and from the right, it was approaching minus 3. Therefore, this limit does not exist. Finally, what is f of 1? This is pretty straightforward. All we have to do is plug in x equals 1 exactly and see where the function is, and we find that it is that point right in the middle, 3. For problem 17, we have a function graph below. We're going to evaluate everything we did in the previous problem, the limit as x approaches minus 1 from the left, from the right, from both directions, and then what is f of minus 1 itself. So as x approaches minus 1 from the left but doesn't quite reach it, we just want to keep track of the value of f of x. So here is a vertical line giving a value of x. It's going to approach negative 1 from the left-hand side. Pay attention to the height of the point of intersection. It's approaching 3. What about as x approaches minus 1 from the right, but doesn't quite reach that value? What happens to the height of the point of intersection? 
So pay attention to the height of the point as it slides, and it also is approaching 3. So now, as x approaches minus 1 from both sides, but doesn't quite reach it, what's going to happen to the height of these points? From both directions, we are approaching the same value of 3. And finally, what's the value f of minus 1? All we have to do is plug in x equals minus 1. We get a nice point on the graph. We see that f of minus 1 is not 3. f of minus 1 is that point of intersection at 0. So the point of this here is even if the limit as x approaches something exists, it might not be the value of the function. Because in our limits we were always taking the value of x approaching but not reaching a particular value, the value of the function at a certain point is actually irrelevant when it comes to computing the limit as x approaches a value of the function. For problem 18, we have the graph of y equals tangent of x from 0 to 2 pi. We're going to compute some limits and look at vertical asymptotes. So, for the limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the right, x is going to approach pi over 2 from the right. It's not quite going to reach pi over 2, and we're going to keep track of the value of y. So here's our value of x and the point of intersection. The value of x is going to slide to the left. Pay attention to the height of the point off it goes, down to minus infinity. So the limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the right of tangent of x is minus infinity. What does this result indicate? If the limit as x approaches a value is plus or minus infinity, then that x value is a vertical asymptote. So x equals pi over 2 is a vertical asymptote of the graph of tangent. Next, what's the limit as x approaches 3 pi over 2 from the left? Well, as x approaches, but doesn't quite reach 3 pi over 2, what's going to happen to the value of the function? So again, we're going to take our x value and slide it to the right and pay attention to the height of the point of intersection. And off it shoots to plus infinity. So this limit is plus infinity. And again, if the limit as x approaches some value of a function is plus or minus infinity, then that x value is a vertical asymptote. Finally, the graph of secant x is given below from 0 to 2 pi. Compute the limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the right of secant of x. Well, x is going to approach pi over 2 from the right. We're going to not quite reach pi over 2 and pay attention to the height of the point of intersection. So here's a given value of x with a point of intersection with the graph. As x approaches pi over 2 from the right, we keep an eye on the height of the point of intersection and off it flew to minus infinity. So this limit is minus infinity, and if x approaching something gives a limit of plus or minus infinity, then that value of x is a vertical asymptote of the function. For part c, we're going to approach 3 pi over 2 from the left, but not quite reach 3 pi over 2, and as we do, we're going to keep track of the y value. So here's a given x value with a point of intersection, and as we slide x to the right, look at the height of the point of intersection, and off it flew to minus infinity as well. So this limit is minus infinity, and again, if x approaching a value from one side or the other gives you a limit of plus or minus infinity, then that x value is a vertical asymptote of the function.